and hopefully riot in it. Um, our next panel um, is advancing both climate justice and er, both climate action and justice in Asia. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Sorry, I need my phone to make sure that everybody <laughs> shut up on time. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, first, a bit of introduction of myself. I'm Ya Chao Wang. I'm a China researcher for Human Rights Watch. I work on uh, human rights issues regarding China. Uh, today, I'm extremely happy that, you know, Breakthrough is having this panel because yesterday we were heard about what the U.S. should do in terms of technology and whether, you know, uh, qu qu quiet climate policy is enough, you know, what's the role of the conservatives in the climate movement. But, uh, I mean, the world, I'm from China, so I always remind people, you know, the world is not just about the U.S. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, I mean, China accounts for 30% of the global emission. Asia accounts for more than half of the global emission. So in order for any kind of climate policy to work, to actually have an effect, we must, you know, uh, bring other important actors into the conversation. That's why we are having this panel today. Uh, uh, it's a very diverse panel. I mean, among the four of us, two of us have the same last name. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's no neptis neptism going on, so. Uh, uh, I mean, so today's the purpose of the, the talk is to, you know, to talk about how we uh, balance, you know, the, the tensions between the U.S. China, uh, geopolitically, human rights, and also how, you know, within that background, how we can work together. Uh, you know, with, uh, we all know that, uh, you know, China's committing serious human rights violations uh, in Xinjiang. About one million uh, ethnic Uyghur Muslims are in camps. There are terrible uh, you know, surveillance going on in this uh, region. I mean, uh, you know, by Human Rights Watch's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, an analysis, they are committing, you know, crime against humanity in the region. And the U.S. government has, you know, defined that situation, you know, is worse to be uh, defined as, you know, genocide. Uh, also, China is doing a lot of human rights violations, encroaching the freedom in Hong Kong. Also, China once, you know, has been saying the same thing for years that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it wants to, you know, bring Taiwan under the reign of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so, you know, how we deal with, how do how we cooperate with the country that's been you know doing all those human rights uh, uh, violations? Um, now I'm going to introduce our panel of uh, uh, panelists. First, uh, uh, Silver Wang. Uh, he's a, a senior uh, climate and uh, uh, climate an analyst at uh, Breakthrough Institute. Uh, and then we are going to have a Tobita. Uh, Cho, uh, he's the director of uh, uh, Justice is Global, and then lastly we'll have uh, Professor John Lee, uh, Leo. He's the uh, associate professor of uh, sociology at the National Taiwan University. He's you know joining us from Taipei. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, very much looking forward to this uh, conversation today. Uh, I'll start by providing some further context for this conversation while also sort of expressing my own position. Uh, as anyone even vaguely following international news is well aware, we're currently navigating heightened tensions between uh, Beijing, Washington, and much of the rest of Asia. Um, and especially in some recent in recent months, some uh, US climate activists and progressive allies have argued that we're sort of condemned to failure on climate change unless the unless the United States uh, can can sort of set aside its differences with Chinese leaders and find a way to uh, to partner closely on on climate change 
uh, I want to be upfront that I that I disagree with this narrative. Uh, first, I don't think it's it's true that key progress on climate goals can only be attained uh, if the if the U.S. government can cooperate with the Chinese government uh, closely at a high level. Um, I think there are alternatives to sort of uh, direct engagement um, on climate that could be as effective, if not more effective, and, and perhaps more realistic. Second, I think it's important to consider the full drivers behind tensions uh, uh, between uh, the U.S. and China, um, which which mean that there are sort of uh, hard limitations on the on the uh, on the magnitude, the extent to which the U.S. and China could cooperate closely on on climate, with a key limitation actually being the receptiveness of Chinese leaders uh, to U.S. climate outreach. Um, so to dive into this a little more, um, uh, sort of advocates for, for this sort of uh, cooperative vision of, of U.S.-China climate relations uh, often have a number of aspirations for what this cooperation might look like. On the one hand, Washington might push for more ambitious climate policies in China. On the other hand, uh, because China is a major manufacturer of clean tech products, uh, the U.S. and China might work together to sort of secure global trade in these you know, essential technologies. Um, there's the vision that the U.S. and China could cooperate on international uh, climate initiatives like boosting funding for climate adaptation or for adoption of clean energy in emerging and developing economies. Uh, my reaction to this is all of these are, are, are of course, uh, worthy goals, uh, but it's not clear to me that sort of a close U.S. Uh, partnership with uh, with the Chinese government at a high level is necessary for advancing all of, for advancing all of these, or in some cases even uh, necessarily a particularly uh, um, uh, powerful uh, lever with which to affect change in these areas. Um, so to dive into this uh, with a little more detail, so to look at, for example, climate policy in China, it's been quite clear over the last year or so that the national government in China has signaled a, a high level sort of strategic shift in its thinking on, on climate with its with the declaration of a 2060 sort of carbon neutrality target around this time last year. A few weeks ago, um, uh, Xi Jinping at the UN declared that China would phase out financing for future coal projects abroad. Um, and, and this has been signaled in domestic policy making as well, that, that sort of uh, climate change is, is viewed at, at the national level to be a, uh, an issue of high priority. So the main barriers to ambitious decarbonization policy in China now are, are actually internal. We're, we're kind of seeing some of these tensions now with the, with the coal crunch, the, the energy crisis uh, in China. Um, and as such, it's unclear to me that Washington some, that holds the secret key to unlocking sort of the, politi the political economy of these climate conversations in China, or that Washington could somehow, through close engagement with the Chinese government, tip the, the political balance of these internal conversations. And if, and if the U.S. is just this external actor applying pressure on, on China to sort of adopt a higher climate ambition, it's not clear to me that this pressure necessarily has to come in a conciliatory form as opposed to in a more critical form. So on the issue of clean tech manufacturing, the justification of the motivation often is that China is a major supplier of solar panels and batteries, and that if the U.S. and China don't get along, we simply won't have enough of these things and decarbonization efforts will fail. Uh, I think this is a little sort of a, a short-sighted of, of a view because uh, the fact is that um, China's clean tech industry today, as, as gargantuan as it is, actually wouldn't suffice to meet uh, demand for, for sort of clean tech products, for, for uh, clean tech deployment, uh, even, even later this decade under sort of ambitious uh, decarbonization scenarios. Um, so it's a little early to say that China is, for example, a, a key partner when it comes to solar, when we're going to need maybe three times or four times the solar industry of today um, uh, later this decade uh, in order to sort of uh, shoot towards a, a 1.5 or 2 degree uh, climate target. Um, as such, I, I sort of see it as uh, if there's more competition to set up clean tech manufacturing sort of around the world with different countries trying different approaches and innovating and, and using different uh, sort of technologies, I think that's a, probably a good thing. Um, and similarly, as we're sort of seeing from supply chain challenges over the last few months, it also might be a good idea to sort of insulate the, the project of the clean energy transition from, from as much risk as possible and avoid concentrating too much clean, product, clean tech production in a single country of manufacture. And we also have to remember sort of what China's uh, sort of supposed comparative advantage in clean tech manufacturing comes from. And, and to be frank, it's, it's built on coal-fired power. There are associated sort of environmental concerns. Uh, there have been uh, um, uh, credible allegations of, of forced labor in the, in the solar supply chain. Um, and as such, you know, from a climate and equity perspective, again, it might be a good idea to sort of 
ensure that uh, more of the growth in clean tech manufacturing takes place um, uh, outside of China and is, is more diversified uh, globally. Um, so turn, turning to sort of international climate goals, uh, almost any international climate goal that you could sort of imagine advancing, you could advance amidst, amidst US-China tensions, sort of without uh, close partnership being necessary. I'll use the example of China's recent declaration to phase out international financing of, uh, of future coal projects. This takes place at a time of historic US-China tensions. It's clear that feelings of friendship towards the United States played little role in sort of uh, encouraging Chinese leaders to make this unilateral commitment. What did play a role are factors like long-time pressure on other financiers of coal, like South Korea and Japan, engagement with countries that would have uh, built these coal projects, like Indonesia and Vietnam, very critical U.S. engagement of, of China on the question of international coal finance over the past year since the Biden administration took office, and then many years of dialogue about the need to phase out coal, uh, the, um, you know, uh, initiatives like in the, in the UNFCCC, talking about sort of a, a global coal phase out, um, the World Bank, et cetera. Um, and it's important that, that sort of ten, uh, uh, climate progress can still be advanced amidst U.S.-China tensions because uh, I, 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 the way I see it, U.S.-China relations are likely to remain tense. And you can sort of see this highlighted um, in U.S.-China climate dialogue in the, past, in, in the past year or so, where the U.S. side has actually been very clear that they see climate change as an issue where uh, they hope to be able to cooperate with Chinese leaders, uh, even if there are disagreements elsewhere in the relationship. However, um, uh, it's actually been Chinese diplomats and, and Chinese leadership that have signaled in very clear terms that they don't see climate change as an issue that can be separated out from other issues in the U.S.-China relationship, which they see as strained. And they see it as strained for very specific reasons. And as you can see here from this official statement from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they see it as strained in particular because of uh, U.S. criticism of the Chinese system of government, uh, and specifically because of U.S. policies and rhetoric regarding Xinjiang, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, which they explicitly identify in this document. And so I hope you can see here that, you know, I see, the way I see it, Washington has very little maneuvering room on, on these sort of geopolitical and moral issues for, for securing the close partnership with, with Beijing on climate change if the prerequisite from the Chinese perspective is that the U.S.-China relationship needs to be improved in these terms. And I, I would suggest that a given sort of domestic political constraints in the U.S., Washington also has little maneuvering room on sort of economic issues. Um, but this, but and so there are key limitations as such on on sort of being able the the the, the extent to which the U.S. could secure a close partnership on climate. Um, but fortunately, as as I've sort of laid out throughout this presentation, the way I see it, close high-level U.S.-China partnership on climate isn't necessary for uh, for reducing global emissions or and sort of advancing uh, global decarbonization. Uh, with that, I'll uh, end there and turn things over to uh, my my next panelist. Would you like to start? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank Seaver for uh, organizing this panel. Uh, uh, most discussions in the US about this topic like don't look like this, so I really appreciate it. And thanks to my other panelists as well. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so uh, I want to start by uh, giving uh, my perspective on the importance of US-China cooperation on uh, climate action. Um, and I think this is important uh, globally. And uh, I feel like part of where I'm coming from is uh, maybe bringing a different kind of like uh, philosophical framework to how we address um, global challenges uh, that just emphasizes the importance of collaboration and cooperation and collective action um, over uh, um, the benefits of competition. And this is also informed by uh, uh, our experience at Justice is Global. Um, this year, we've been working on the issue connected to the pandemic, another great global challenge of uh, trying to fight um, a global vaccine apartheid and the, this grotesque inequality in access to COVID vaccines um, between rich and poor countries. And um, what I think we experienced there is uh, the idea that healthy competition can give us the solutions we need to urgent global challenges is just not, not playing out, um, and certainly not in the, the global system as it currently exists. Um, so I want to make this more concrete, and uh, I want to start with a story of US-China cooperation on climate change. And I get this from Kevin Gallagher, who is at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University, and also works with the uh, UN Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, so two years ago, 
uh, China was in talks with a US-led multilateral development bank, uh, and they were in talks to create a new fund that would finance specifically clean energy projects in a certain set of developing countries. And they were working out a deal uh, in which China would provide uh, capital, a large amount of capital to finance clean energy development, and would also provide technological know-how around clean energy manufacturing in these developing countries. Uh, and this draws on some of China's strengths. Uh, they're willing to put up large amounts of capital to finance development projects uh, and their leaders uh, across a range of clean energy industries. Um, the US-led development bank, uh, for its part, would provide lower interest rates than developing countries would get if they did business with China directly. Uh, and it would also set labor and environmental standards. Um, in addition to that, uh, all projects uh, that were financed through this fund um, would be open to bids from US companies. Uh, so this is a story about um, a vision for triangular cooperation in which the US and China cooperate to accelerate climate action in developing countries. Um, and this form of cooperation uh, would bring distinct benefits to stakeholders in all three countries, and it would set a precedent for more ambitious forms of US-China climate cooperation. Um, so this is two years ago uh, in 2019. Uh, apparently, Vice President Pence at the time heard about it and just quashed it completely. Um, that kind of cooperation with China uh, was not going to fly under the Trump administration and maybe certainly under climate. Uh, that makes it um, maybe even worse. Um, and now uh, there is a clause in the Innovation and Competition Act, which passed in the Senate earlier this year, this big anti-China bill, um, that would actually write the Trump position against cooperation with China through US-led multilateral development banks uh, into law. Um, but this time it's, it's uh, Democrats leading on it. it, it the, that clause was authored um, by a Democratic senator. Um, so that story about uh, triangular cooperation shows how US-China cooperation can accelerate um, financing and tech sharing around clean energy um, industries um, uh, with developing countries. And I think these are important needs in global climate action. There are some other forms of cooperation that I think uh, we need to see. Uh, in other areas, um, one would be debt relief, which is also essential for um, uh, transition plans in developing countries. Uh, we also need changes to global rules that are currently creating obstacles to bold climate action, again, especially in developing countries. Um, and US-China cooperation is important for all of these points, um, but US-China cooperation on climate change and other matters is under threat. Uh, and there are, of course, challenges on the, the uh, the Chinese side, I'm going to focus on how these play out here in the US. Um, fundamentally, I think it, th these threats are a product of um, a phase that we're entering into of zero sum economic and military competition um, between uh, the two countries. And in the United States, um, I think that a lot of the motivation for this fundamentally comes from a desire to. Um, uh, protect uh, U.S. global dominance and the power and privilege that the U.S. has enjoyed uh, in the world for generations now. Um, and uh, I think we need to carefully separate two criticisms of, of China, two sources of, chi of, of tension in the U.S.-China relationship. Um, on the one hand, there's this uh, U.S. economic and military hostility uh, towards China, which is driven by commitment to uh, continuing U.S. global dominance on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have these legitimate uh, human rights concerns and, and criticisms of China. And, and these two kinds of criticisms, these two sources of tension are, are very frequently like smushed together in, in dominant uh, narratives about the U.S.-China relationship. I feel like people sometimes flip between one, one or the other, depending on whatever is most rhetorically convenient in the context. Um, but I think they're very important to separate um, because, in fact, uh, um, and this is my last point, I believe that increasing economic and military hostility towards China within the context of US politics threatens both climate action and a consistent human rights agenda. Um, so. Uh, only time for one point here. Okay, so one point about this. Um, I think it uh, ultimately undermines uh, human rights advocacy directed towards China that comes from the US. And uh, a reason for this is like, what are the tools that we have our, at our dis disposal? Uh, well, we can um, impose 
we can we can create policies that impose an economic cost on China um, as punishment uh, or leverage um, or pressure around human rights abuses. Um, problem is if if Chinese leaders uh, can plausibly look at the overall trend of the U.S. Econ uh, China economic relationship and see that that relationship is becoming fundamentally antagonistic, uh, that severely reduces the, the incentive that they feel to make improvements on those human rights abuses because they could reasonably come to believe that um, improvements in human rights in China is not going to result in any payoff in the U.S.-China economic relationship because the U.S. wants to, um, uh, wants to undermine that relationship for reasons that are quite independent of human rights. Um, and I think this is uh, um, part of what happened in, in the in part of what undermined the U.S. response to um, uh, the crackdown on pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong, for example. Um, okay, so conclusion, uh, I think we need to uh, reject this commitment to preserving U.S. global dominance and the zero in the zero sum competition mindset replace it with a strategy that uh, combines a priority on US-China cooperation on climate, um, but without uh, sacrificing the human rights agenda. And I think uh, rejecting that zero-sum competition framework is essential to creating a consistent uh, human rights agenda for the US. John, do you want to go ahead? All right. Oh, I hear myself. Okay. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Siever, for organizing this panel and thank uh, my fellow panelists. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here, especially on a day with one of the most heightened tension in this part of the world. Maybe you see this on the news. China sent a record-breaking 56 aircrafts into Taiwan's air defense identification zone yesterday. And in case you're wondering how we are feeling here, ironically, Taiwanese people are very calm as we are used to such threats. People are actually chatting more about squid games rather than fighter jets. Okay, and regarding today's topic, while we are discussing either cooperation or competition between US and China, I want first want to make the point that if two parties want to cooperate, there have to be will from both sides. However, I, I study uh, Chinese climate change policy professionally. I mainly see competition through the Chinese perspective, especially under the Xi Jinping's era. To me, Beijing is acting on climate for its own interests, and they are quite serious about it. China's climate action is not about responding to some types of international pressure. Actually, that is the least thing the Chinese Communist Party want to be seen as. They are not bending to the US pressure. It's, it's a sign of weakness. So let me elaborate this point by sharing a research I've done a few years back. While academics uh, in, tend to focus on the climate skepticism and denialism in the West, I found there is also a Chinese variety. After the Copenhagen summit, there was a series of popular publication the frames uh, climate change as the American plot, the low carbon plot, they call it. It's a plot trying to limit China's emissions and thus its own development space. And in the official arena, we seldom hear uh, Chinese government express, expresses such views. But I think the fundamental worldview that sees climate issue as a struggle between superpowers resonates with a lot of elites in China. And interestingly, such view does not result in climate delays. And in the recent interview, uh, one official, uh, high official in China, uh, reiterated the point that, that somewhat jokingly, that even if climate change is a plot from the US, they are confident to beat the West in this game. So for the Chinese Communist Party, tackling climate is a win-win-win strategy. First, they, number one, they can deal with the deadly local pollutions to maintain social stabilities with some climate efforts. Second, China can lead the world in the next industrial revolution to, as shown in their aggressive investment in solar and wind 
clean, as, as we all know, clean energy is a key resources in the climate constrained world. And, and thus China is acting to avoid being what they call to be, to be choked or controlled by the West, like they have seen in other sectors. And finally, dealing with climate actually helped China build some kind of its, its soft power as we all see during Trump's era. So seeing climate change as a superpower struggle means that it's highly nationalistic and often antagonistic. And this is often to be clear, regardless of what the US does, either Trump or Biden. So let me give you another example. Just a couple of years ago, this is also my research, um, an American environmental NGO called, uh, it's called Wild Eight. They try to promote a really uh, something, I would say really non-political and harmless green lifestyle campaign uh, to promote vegetarianism in China. It sounds, sounds pretty good to me, but the campaign turned out to be a fiasco and only generates negative publicities. And the reason, uh, the messenger is wrong. I mean, the, the people, the netizens, uh, basically in their Reddit equivalent, they question why Americans tell Chinese people to eat less meat while eating so many hamburgers. Some even say that environmental groups are intentionally trying to weaken Chinese bodies. And we can trace such opinions to China's patriotic education that frames American imperialists as the enemy. So all of these are in the larger background of the low point in the US-China relations. So after the rapid growth for many decades, the Chinese Communist Party sees the West, especially the US, is in, in an irreversible decline. So this trend makes the Chinese very confident that their authoritarian system is superior than the American democratic system uh, to deal with climate change. So I've met colleagues who are very jealous of the ambitious moves uh, on climate in China. There is what we call this, if we can be China for a day type of sentiment. China can push for big change in a short time and does not want care what the local people have to say. And yes, I do want to give China some credits to significantly increase renewables in a short time and also propose a net zero timeline. I think there are certainly positive news uh, uh, for the world. But there are also many terms to describe uh, Chinese types of climate governance. We call this coercive environmentalism or eco-authoritarianism, green authoritarianism. Um, many people longing for radical solutions, but whatever term we use to describe China's model, it won't save the planet. China's climate governance is based on a top-down, non-consultative, sometimes very often repressive measures. On the one hand, this types of moves centralize power under Xi Jinping's political leadership. The state actually exploits ecological concerns as a new form of political capital, harnessing to extend authoritarian resilience. On the other hand, very often the climate measures also uh, are darn at a cost of citizens' rights and livelihoods. We have seen the situation of in Xinjiang you know, of the Uyghur people and the solar supply chain, but there are many other examples. For, uh, for instance, in the name to reduce carbon, uh, some provincial governments in China violently took away people's heat stove uh, from uh, rural areas to leave people in the cold because it's burning, I mean, the stove uses coal and it's not good for the environment, right? And so many of these eco and green initiatives in China actually leads to uneven development and displace poor and ethnic minorities, especially in the rural area. So where does all of these leave us? Back to the question that Siva proposed. Uh, I, I think I would not see climate and everything else as separate spheres. I mean, some somehow, the people seeing climate as less about politics, so we can decouple and let's talk about climate and human rights on the other side, right? And to me, that's not very real. That's not a very realistic position. And 
in, in Taiwan, we are at the front line to counter China's aggression. Right? We see everyday uh, eminent sufferings, especially my, my friends in Hong Kong, they lost so much in a short time. They went from one of the most liberal places in the world to a place where young people get arrested by hanging wrong flags or studying a labor protest. And it's ongoing. Right? And so I, I need, I, I will, I will quickly wrap up. So to pursue an effective and just foreign, uh, US foreign and climate policy in Asia, uh, I think we should talk more about uh, more than just technology, finance and reduction ambitions. Those are important, but we should also talk about the values that embody in the climate governance. Tackling climate change is about how we choose to live on this planet. And it's also about autocracy versus democracy. So to me, the most effective US foreign policy, maybe ironically, actually starts at home. The US has to show some true climate leaderships, right? So I have Taiwanese colleagues questioning whether the US will retreat from Paris Agreement again. If so, why should we even care, right? So clear US leadership on climate reduction, ambitions, and technology is critical to assure, especially US allies around the world, that is ready to take uh, climate seriously. Right, so I'll end here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Siver and Toby and John for the presentation. Uh, I mean, we just talked about, you know, what's China says what it wants to do in terms of uh, you know climate policies, you know whether we should go to the how we can work together the both sides and how we can compete to achieve the goals. So I mean, last yesterday I've been uh, during the dinner and lunch I've been asked several times, you know, to what extent what the Chinese government say about their cl climate goals are sincere. I mean, uh, you know, early this year. President Xi Jinping said, uh, you know, we, the China's emission will peak in 2030 and uh, we, China will achieve carbon neutral by 2060. And last uh, month, you know, Xi Jinping said uh, uh, China will not uh, find, uh, build more coal-fired power pro uh, projects abroad. Those are very positive. But we all know, I mean, I study human rights issues in China. The Chinese government says stuff that uh, are blatantly false, making promise it has no heart to, to uh, you know, keep uh, uh, all the time, right? It says, you know, the, the crime against humanity, the genocide is not happening in Xinjiang. You know, the people in Xinjiang live happily and they love to go to the, the camps, right? So that's uh, obviously, uh, you know, fake. And on the other hand, uh, you know, there are a lot of environment activists in the past, I would say, you know, 10 or 20 years, they've gone to jail, they've been detained uh, for, you know, uh, criticizing the Chinese government's environment policies or, you know, or even just to try to, uh, you know, protest against some factories polluting the, the, their local rivers. So if you, they're sincere on, you know, climate, on environment, why would they detain you know, any kind of civil society activism? So, you know, I'm going to pose the questions to the panelists. To what, what do you think, you know, to what extent China is sincere about what it's, you know, it's saying in terms of, you know, what we wanted to do better? So where do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I, so I, I think that uh, um, it's very clear that sort of the, the UN statements by, by Xi Jinping on the topic of climate change, these sorts of, 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 Statements, you know, by um, by the by by the Chinese leader in in an international setting, carry a lot of sort of um, uh, there's a lot of implications in terms of you know national prestige, et cetera. So I think, you know, to an extent, uh, these are these are important to take seriously. Um, uh, but I only I only say to an extent, um, and I think it's it's worth noting that um, while China has set these very ambitious sort of long term targets, um, there people who, who sort of follow um, Chinese energy policy more closely have pointed to somewhat of a reluctance, which again is sort of uh, um, results from domestic political barriers, uh, but somewhat of a reluctance to, to take more ambitious uh, near-term action. Um, there have been, there's been some, some sort of disappointment around sort of uh, early revelations around the, the, the 14th uh, five-year plan, for instance, around 
whether or not China might pursue a more uh, uh, um, uh, a more ambitious time frame for sort of peaking emissions uh, this decade, uh, et cetera. And then uh, similarly, I think it's uh, it's important to note that um, there are important as as John mentioned in his presentation, there's really strong incentives in China to to act on climate. So I think it's important to to recognize that you know air pollution reduction, reduction uh, protecting you know Chinese people from climate impacts, uh, technology leadership, uh, um, soft power. Um, uh, but at the same time, I also uh, this is my personal opinion. I do wonder whether. Uh, like where that ambition ends, uh, like whether or like to what degree China might might be receptive to, you know, framing uh, um, international climate goals around a 1.5 degree target instead of a two degree target, for instance. It's not clear to me that, you know, the level of ambition is sufficient to shoot for, you know, 1.5. Um, and so I say serious to an extent. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Um, rather than like asking it in terms of sincerity, yeah, I want to think about what are the reasons that are felt to be important by Chinese leadership to like hold to these commitments versus what are the what are like the interest groups and so on within China that are, are going to be obstacles um, to um, to to these these commitments. And uh, um, yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, I don't have, have much to add to what what Siever just just ran through. Um, and uh, on the point about um, the, this apparent contradiction between uh, these climate goals versus detaining environmental activists, I think like this is um, uh, a feature across um, uh, uh, the policy we're seeing from China right now, where they're sort of doing some things that, um, as, as a progressive, I think like, oh, that seems all right. Um, but it's paired with like these severely repressive policies directed against activists who try to move those things along. We're also seeing this around like there's on the one hand um, crackdowns on labor activists in China who organize against uh, Chinese companies. Um, so we're pressing that. But then the Chinese government also taking steps to like crack down on on Chinese companies um, themselves, right? And it's it's um, in in ways that that can maybe seem like they're designed to address some um, popular resentments against certain sectors of, of, of uh, Chinese business. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, so I think like that contradiction just runs throughout um, different areas of policy in China. Before John jumping, I mean, I should have mentioned that, I mean, China is not a democracy. So, I mean, the legitimacy, uh, relies upon a lot on you know economic growth China has experienced 40 years of economic growth so I mean and the Chinese government needs to balance economic growth with you know its, its climate target I mean uh, you know I think that it could play a role you know what do you think John okay I'll jump in now and so on the question of whether China is sincere or not I think that I will see this at the top level, and I think as I illustrated, I, I think they are quite serious about it. But on the other hand, it's also quite difficult to do. Like China is the largest country in the world, so many people, and with many different levels of government with different priorities and motives, right? So the implementation is hard and I, we have to recognize that. But in terms of the higher, uh, the highest level uh, of government, I think they're quite serious about it. So I will I tend to push back from some criticism saying that oh China is serious is not serious, so we should not act. I think that that's wrong. Yeah. And I also think I'm going back to the point I made in my presentation. Uh, I, this is a, a grand strategy, right? And China sees climate change as we will reinvent our economy. This is their best chance to to take the lead or even to global dominance. I, I think they, they do have that ambition and global dominance so that in the old economy, if we're talking about cars, about semiconductors, all the technology are mostly controlled by the advanced countries. And in the new economy, they have, if they, they move fast, they have a chance. So I think this is their the larger grand strategy and they are quite serious about this. So can I add one thing about this? Sure. Yeah, so uh, there is uh, a dominant narrative that I think is kind of a myth about how the Chinese state and the Chinese government works. And this myth goes that um, it's like highly integrated 
Uh, and like Xi Jinping like gets whatever he wants. He just snaps his fingers and then it, and then it happens. I've seen it actually compared to the Borg in Star Trek. Like it's this hive mind, it's a bunch of individuals acting as one. And that's really not true. <laughs> there are a lot of competing interest groups uh, in China. Um, um, how political and economic power was like highly decentralized during the reform and opening up period, now being re-centralized under Xi Jinping. But um, yeah, that's an important point to see, to understand what we're talking about, I think. I think we have a kind of consensus here, consensus here that, you know, we think China, what it says regarding the climate goals are sincere to a large extent. However, I mean, the climate goal is just one goal of the Chinese government. There are other goals of the Chinese government. You know, I wanted to quote uh, the uh, foreign minister, China's foreign minister Wang Yi during uh, John Kerry's visit to China. He said, the U.S. should stop regarding China as a threat and adversary. Climate policies cannot possibly be divorced from other geopolitical tension. The U.S. side hopes that climate cooperation can be an oasis uh, in U.S.-China relations. But if that oasis is surrounded by desert, it will also become desert sooner or later. later. So, I mean... You know, even China is sincere in you know improving you know its climate policies. But China sees you know if the U.S. try to uh, you know be adversary to China, try to criticize China's human rights policies in Xinjiang, try to you know become more uh, hostile towards China with regard to Taiwan, we could uh, you know we're gonna you know leverage this climate in it you know, the other uh, uh, other aspects of the U.S.-China relation. I mean, how even, China, you know, the U.S. wants to silo this uh, climate, climate discussion uh, and wanted to make it apart from other discussions with China. But the China doesn't want to do that. How does the U.S. should do and respond to that kind of strategy of the U.S. leveraging the climate for other purposes? Uh, let's go from Tobina first. Yeah, uh, so uh, in my opening remarks, I said that um, you know, I'm recommending an approach that is prioritizing U.S.-China cooperation on climate, and I would add like other global challenges, um, but not sacrificing human rights. Um, I think we're actually a more consistent uh, human rights agenda in U.S. foreign policy. Um, so that's easy to say. There are, of course, like really hard dilemmas that you run into there, um, and uh, I don't think that we should be sacrificing human rights, labor rights, and, and, and so on. In, um, in, in our transition to a clean energy economy like anywhere, uh, and that includes um, in, in China. Um, but uh, the thing that um, I, I wanna assert is that um, uh, the, the core of the tensions, the growing tensions between uh, the US and China is um, is about uh, the zero-sum military and economic competition. It's about um, this um, a conflict over over like global power, and um, and for both sides in different ways that the the human rights issues um, get wrapped up um, in 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 that uh, zero-sum competition dynamic and uh, just get consistently confused. And um, uh, I think that. There are a number of actors uh, on the U.S. side that do that um, intentionally. I think it's a way um, um, for many, not, not the people here on this panel, but I think for many actors in U.S. politics, it's a way of putting a veneer of moral principle over a project that is fundamentally about protecting U.S. privilege and U.S. power over the rest of the world. Um, and I think that poisons the conversations about human rights and makes them more intractable than they might otherwise be if they were taking place in the context of a different kind of approach to the US, overall approach to the US-China relationship. That would not solve all of the problems, um, but uh, I think it would create new opportunities to make progress on both human rights and on climate. John, do you want to follow? Yes, so on the question, so the question is about how, if China does not Want, going back to Yacho's question, if China does not see this as separate, how do we cooperate? And as I begin with my presentation, I see 
it's not only the U some of the U.S. politicians see this as a zero sum game. Many people in China also see this as a zero sum game, right? And I see mainly. Come, I mean, there are. I mean, the dominant narrative in the Chinese. So, I mean, political sphere is is competition, right? and there is also, uh, and there's also within China, the the most vocal, aggressive voices often gets amplified and it gets into this vicious circle that that, that we're seeing, right? And for, for for me, that's a. And we see on the foreign policy, we see people like wolf warriors, and these are uh, like really unconventional, like diplomatic activities to be to be polite. But I, I think that's that's internal to China, and it's not about uh, how U.S. Uh, reach out, right? So I'll, I'll end here. And see if I have anything to add. So basically, you're saying that you know cooperation is not uh, you know it's hard to achieve because China doesn't want no matter what you know U.S. how much the U.S. wants if China doesn't want it's gonna not gonna happen. What, what, what do you think? Uh, so yeah, I, I I'll, I'll go back to a point that John mentioned earlier, which I think is really important to to remember, which is that uh, um, uh, the Chinese government doesn't want to be perceived as yielding to to foreign power to foreign power foreign influence, and as such. I think that, like the, the like, especially among like um, U.S. environmentalists, we need to sort of let go of the of the ro looking back to the rosy Obama era when when uh, when Obama uh, and Xi Jinping were able to uh, you know issue these joint statements on on, on climate change, uh, because right now China is actually making a statement that you know. China is independently, unilaterally making these climate commitments, and that, that's very, and you know, uh, and that's very important. It's asserting, in 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 the view of Chinese leaders, it's asserting Chinese leadership on climate and asserting that this is not taking place because you know Europe or the U.S. asked them to do so. And I think we have to recognize that dynamic when we have to think about you know, can the U.S. and China do a photo op and and some like fancy uh, like public joint initiative? Um, I also think uh, one one other one other. Uh, um, one other key thing to consider is uh, I, I do think so. As a result, like uh, I guess I'll, I'll throw it, I'll I'll loop, try to loop this into the greater theme of uh, quiet climate policy. There is climate quiet quiet climate quiet climate cooperation uh, that could be possible between between the U.S. and China. Um, like this isn't this isn't my idea. This is sort of uh, like many people who who work on uh, engaging with uh, Chinese uh, uh, officials and academics on energy policy issues recognize that there are other routes for cooperation, uh, academic, um, sort of subnational between provinces and, and U.S. states, um, uh, te like technical between between uh, between in, like you know it's 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 important to like like technical standards, like making sure electrical equipment in, produced in one country can work in another country. Like there's mutual interest for that. And so in, in these sorts of less public realms where, where there aren't like, na there isn't like national image at state, uh, there, there is some, some cooperation that's possible. I just wanted to, you know, follow up directly on that in terms of like quiet cooperation, because I mean, I want to Get your uh, all the panelists' ideas on that. And I mean, you work in the nonprofit world, and uh, world, and uh, John works in academia. I mean, I'm from China. Uh, you know, in recent years, the, Ch the U.S. government has instituted much stricter visa rules. So I have, you know, friends who could not come to the U.S. to study just because, you know, the, the broader rules. I trust them. They're not spies. You know, they are interested in the field they study in. You know, in engineer. Uh, so, but this is like the bigger climate uh, climate of U.S.-China tension. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, same is happening between China and Taiwan, right? So, given this, you know, I mean, I just mentioned the U.S. It is harder for China, Chinese academics and activists to come to the U.S. Tobita yesterday was telling me, you know, some labor activists, it's, you know, they couldn't come here. Things, right? Um, well, no, this back in 2018, there are a couple of labor activists that did come to the U.S. and I helped organize a tour of them uh, with meeting with uh, workers and organizers in the U.S. But after that, it was like we couldn't risk it. Yeah, so I mean, it's both ways. It's harder for the U.S. to ch act academics go to China and it's harder for the Chinese come over here. So in this background, like what are your practical suggestions on, you know, how to work cooperate quietly from, you know, academic perspective or the NGO perspective? Uh, do you want to go first, uh, John? Oh, 
required co cooperation in academia. I think that's uh, academia in many ways are more insulated from from politics. So I do think that there are many scientists and, and engineers are working together uh, to address these issues. And I also wanted to add that in even in the supply chain, I, I see there are there are quiet cooperation or coordination going on just because of the economic globalized forces of economic globalization. Right. So U.S. buys a lot of solar panel from China, and that makes solar panel cheaper in the U.S. And you we install more, more and more. So that that's one form of cooperation. If we want to put this, and I, I think that. That would certainly continue. I mean, the, there's, although even with the heightened tension, I, I think there's a lot of people movement, money movement, I mean, uh, good movements between those two countries. Right? And uh, I, yeah, so I, I certainly see there, there are possibilities. Seward, do you want? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of echo something that uh, Tabita mentioned earlier, which is that there is a bit of the, I, there is an area where the where I think the U.S. is um, could do better in this in this realm. Like it shouldn't be this hard, this hard for uh, for Chinese activists or Chinese academics um, or Chinese technical experts to come to the to come to the U.S. Um, like that should like we shouldn't like the, the, uh, uh, I think that the degree of paranoia around uh, visas and admittance and, and spying is, is very unproductive. Um, and when it comes for, uh, so how we can work better with, uh, with sort of uh, Chinese academics and, and activists and, um, uh, um, and sort of organizations, uh, I think uh, here there are, there are two routes for doing this. And one is sort of more traditional pro-establishment. You know, there are, there are approved officials, approved academics, Approved institutions and and sort and sort of like industries that you can interact with and sort of uh, um, and you watch what you you to a degree you practice a bit of self censorship and you watch what you say and you can work with these people um, and and to have, provide input on policy etc. And that's you know that I'm not talking down on that. That's that's uh, it's not a it's not a bad thing. It's an essential sort of form of engagement and input, uh, but it does restrict you. And there is a second form of uh, of outreach. Um, uh, uh, um, and which I think Tabita has some interest in, which is um, outreach to you know groups that maybe are not on the uh, approved, on, on necessarily on the approved list. Um, uh, sort of um, uh, ref like pro-reform scholars, uh, labor movements, uh, environmental activists, um, sort of ethnic rights act, uh, 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 activists, um, and that will close off that, that will close off your access to the officially approved group, sometimes permanently. Um, but it's also a very necessary form of, of sort of uh, dialogue and engagement um, that I think, honestly, a lot more sort of U.S. NGOs and and um, and academics should be engaging in. Um, a lot of them opt for the for the official route instead. Um, and so I just want to highlight that as an area of uh, that's important. It serves a it serves a role by giving a, that by giving visibility to and giving a voice to people. Um, in and in, uh, in and around China, who otherwise would not have a voice, um, and so I think it plays a really important role. And I and I, I, would, I would like to see more sort of engagement along the, that line. Um, yeah, totally agree uh, with that. There is uh, need and opportunity. Like it's increasingly difficult, but still opportunities to engage in that kind of solidarity building um, that has to be extremely quiet. Um, uh, there are also yeah other groups. Uh, it, based in the US that work with like officially approved um, groups in China. There are like environmental groups in the US that have offices, like official offices in China. And part of the deal is they have to have like, uh, they have to work under a Chinese ministry and have like an official government minder, which very which severely limits the kinds of activities that they can do. But I think there's space for both of these um, approaches. Um, I think uh, there is a great need to, um, counter these rising, within the US is a great need to counter these um, rising um, attacks in forms of just blanket and, and, and like racial suspicions of folks coming in from China. There's um, this systemic suspicion of like Chinese international students and researchers and, and academics who, especially in the STEM fields, although not only um, um, like students who come over to like study 
humanities or economics can get suspected of like trying to engage in industrial espionage and things like that, or um, uh, or malign influence campaigns, which is very poorly defined. Um, and that's some stuff that we need to take care of um, here in in the U.S. side. Um, it's cutting off it's it's cutting off relationships that could be built, um, and it's blocking some very smart people from China who want to contribute to research here in the U.S., which I think from a national interest standpoint, like maybe that's not a thing that we should be attacking here in the U.S. So for the last question, I'm going to pose a very threatening scenario. So as John earlier mentioned, I know when he began, he began his presentation, he mentioned that there are 56 uh, military planes from China that is flying near the Taiwan territory. Uh, space territory. Uh, I read the news, it was actually, uh, just before it came to this room, it was 80, so I think they are increasing. Maybe after the panel, there are 100 uh, military planes. So China has been saying, you know, uh, it's going to, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't uh, rule out uh, using military ways to address the Taiwan issue. Uh, in recent years, the rhetoric has become more and more fierce and in their, you know, real actions, like what we have seen over this weekend. So, I mean, the, you know, the U.S. and Taiwan had a signed uh, agreement, or, you know, it's a law, the, the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, which said that you know, the U.S. is supposed to make available all kinds of assistance in the event that China strikes uh, Taiwan. I've been asked many times, is China really going to strike Taiwan. So let's assume this becomes a, you know, a, a very real possibility. And, you know, if this actually happens, you're going to, you know, very disruptive to all kinds of corporate cooperation on climate issues. I mean, so it's essential for us to prevent this scenario from happening in order to achieve, you know, the climate goal that affects everybody. So what do you guys think, like, the U.S. should do to make sure, you know, this is not going to happen? Given that China is making those rhetoric all the time, it, you know, taking real actions, it looks more and more threatening day by day. Uh, maybe, Sigur, you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. So I think uh, this is this is one of those issues where uh, where I, I I I would actually have to disagree that there's necessarily a a, a artificial mishmashing of you know military tension with human rights tensions because um, uh, uh, sort of uh, um, the U.S. sort of taking taking actions to, to to safeguard you know uh, Taiwan's status and autonomy. That's necessarily tied up in, in military affairs, um, and I, I there have been some, uh, um, uh, yeah, there, there there have been some some suggestions, uh, not, not by by no one on yeah by uh, by no one on the stage again that that uh, sort of the U.S. has like engaged in provocation or 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 aggravated the situation, but I think it, it should be really clear from. Um, uh, you know, from from the news like uh, today, and 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 sort of again stepping back and recognizing that that it's Beijing that will not take the option of a violent military invasion of Taiwan off the table. This is where the this is where the you know the the, the potential for escalation comes from. This is the only reason why we're talking about uh, a potential conflict over Taiwan. So, like insofar as we're talking about you know putting aside differences to tackle shared global challenges. I would suggest that you know a very reasonable expectation should be that Chinese leaders should commit to a peaceful resolution of of, of these questions. Uh, as such, um, you know that's not likely to happen. That, that's not likely to happen. Let, let me just be clear. Um, uh, as such, what should the U.S. government do? I think um, uh, I think the current I current I think cur the current uh, trend in U.S. sort of the U.S.'s approach to Taiwan relations is positive. Um, a lot of uh, sort of uh, detailed, quiet communication with um, with uh, the Taiwanese government in Taipei to sort of come up with approaches that best serve uh, the interests of, of Taiwanese people. Um, and at the same time, what should the U.S. do with regards to, to China? I think the U.S. should, in its communications, in its policies, just sort of communicate and signal as much to Beijing as possible that it's not worth it to escalate um, the, the issue over, over Taiwan. It would come with guaranteed economic, humanitarian, uh, reputational costs, and uh, for, ver for, for very high risks, and, uh, and should stress this in, in, in as strong ways as possible. And I would hope that sort of pragmatism, which has, you know, sometimes been attributed to be sort of a, 
a characteristic of Chinese of Chinese leadership. Um, I would hope that pragmatism would prevail and that um, and that escalation could be avoided. John, since you're from Taiwan. <laughs> Okay, so this is a topic really dear to my heart, obviously. And so thank you for, for posing this question. And do not normalize bullying. Do not normalize violence. And I entirely agree with what Steve just said. The provocation does not start by Taiwanese people electing our own president or by trying to have freedom, right? So provocation starts from Beijing, and that's very clear, and we should be very clear about that, right? So I, I think and in regards to what the US government should do, I, I think the, I see many positive signals, right? And uh, for example, the net price uh, from Department of State uh, issue and the state announcements condemning the, the flying of aircrafts uh, into Taiwan's uh, airspace. And, and we also see the US also normalize many relationships with, with the Taiwanese government, right? So with many kind of smaller steps, right? So for just so you know that for a few years back, Taiwanese officials cannot even enter uh, the State Department just for, for some bureaucratic uh, limitations, uh, but constrained by the US government itself. And I think there's gradual improvements uh, that uh, Taiwan is treated just normally as, as, a, as a country. And to me, that's, that's really important. And in terms of the military conflict, I mean, just to be clear, Taiwanese people have responsibility to defend ourselves, right? The Taiwan, Taiwan Relation Act is, only says the US will provide assistance and does not, I mean, does not guarantee any kind of involvement. Taiwanese people are, uh, are working hard, very hard to defend ourselves. And our president Tsai Ing-wen actually wrote, just wrote a piece on foreign affairs in, in today, right? So I encourage all of you to read that. And I think she said that we are, uh, in the case of uh, our, uh, our, our, our democratic value and the way of living based on democracy is not, it's not off to sacrifice. And we will, if our, way of life based on democracy will, will be threatened and we will, will fight to the end, right? And so I think that she made that very clear. And I think that's also the voice of many uh, the Taiwanese people here. Thank you, John. Uh, we have less than 10 minutes. Maybe we can, do you have any, a last word to add on this? Um, uh, no, well, one, one thing that I think is important for, um, for this is, I don't disagree uh, with uh, any of the, the main points that uh, Sivir and John made, but uh, one important thing is um, uh, there is increasingly, I think, a trend of um, a kind of like threat inflation around, not that the threats from China against Taiwan aren't real, but they get exaggerated in terms of how likely they are and how soon they're likely to occur. And the very compelling reasons uh, why Chinese leadership would not want to take all the risks that would come with an invasion of Taiwan, I think are, not given enough enough weight and like trying to weigh like how likely is this is this going to happen like tomorrow or next month or within the next six years or whatever and there's a lot of rhetoric that I think um, is uh, just making a lot of uh, unwarranted assumptions and, and not really understanding what's at stake uh, for for Chinese leadership and um, this is important for me because um, uh, the overall message that I think a lot of people get is that uh, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is both inevitable and imminent. Um, and I think that's really, uh, that really undermines the space for us to construct, I think, a, um, a reasonable uh, a position towards Taiwan, which has to be about um, avoiding um, a, a, a military conflict with China in a, in a, in a, in a Chinese invasion, because it makes it seem like um, uh, the only options are, um, are, we're going to war with China any day now, or we have to abandon Taiwan. And I think if those are the only two options that you think are available, um, it's going to lead to some bad choices on our part. Thank you. Now we open up for questions. We have Thank 10 you. minutes, less than 10 minutes. Thank you. This one's, there we go. Uh, good morning. That was a very fascinating discussion. My name is Zaina Bosman, and I'm the uh, director for Africa, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So my question is uh, directed specifically at Siva. 
uh, your presentation, your last slide, you had a bullet point there in which you said you don't really see the US-China tensions as having any impact on global emissions. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you have considered uh, the potential implications of these tensions on third party countries. Um, and, and there could be various mechanisms through which, which this could happen. One being the uh, diffusion and adoption of clean energy technologies. So let me elaborate just a bit, sorry. Uh, so for the countries that I cover in Africa, uh, China is now the leading trade, um, the leading bilateral trade partner since 2009. Um, and China is a market leader when it comes to uh, solar panels and the other clean energy technology that we tend not to mention, which is hydro. So in a situation where these US-China tensions intensify to such an, to such an extreme kind of uh, level where countries are increasingly pressured to choose sides, and we're already seeing that also happening in Africa, with respect to telecoms infrastructure, where again, China has been a leading provider, Huawei, ZTE, and the others. Do you not see, or do you not think that this could potentially affect their ability to use clean energy technologies and also their ability to uh, potentially reduce uh, um, uh, carbon emissions? Thank you. Silver, do you want to address? Oh, I don't know if we're doing multiple questions first. Okay. Hi, I'm Earl Ellis. I'm a professor of geography and environmental systems and someone who spent a fair amount of time in China. And I thought that was really a wonderful panel in giving some really solid background on what's really the real politic of what's going on in China. Uh, it's pretty clear that the way things are going right now, if there isn't this kind of dramatic warfare thing happens, that China is going to be the dominant economic military and force in the world. It's going to be, it's going to displace the United States as the dominant power. Uh, and it also clearly, as, as you described, it has at one of the central points, I think, and I don't think that's an unrealistic thing. Unlike the United States, one of the central strategic elements of this rise to international dominance is this new economy, this new green economy that's centered around a decarbonized world. So it's, it's a, do you see this? Now, I'm going to flip the thing. We're talking about U.S. influencing China. How is this dominance of, this, of China in this new car decarbonized economy going to change the U.S.? Um, and I'll ask one final question. Uh, Zeke House Father, Director of Climate and Energy here at Breakthrough. It's uh, great to see you, John. It's been a long time. <laughs> uh, so China, as you guys mentioned earlier, you know, we, we tend to think of it as very monolithic as Borgi, uh, and there is a lot of regional autonomy. Um, you know, we've seen with past efforts like air pollution controls that the regions and the provinces don't always listen to the central government fully. You know, people turn on scrubbers when the inspectors come in their power plants and turn them off when they leave. And so what ex to what extent do you think this sort of compliance problems uh, are going to get in the way of rapid Chinese decarbonization? And, you know, how is the consolidation of power that's happening right now potentially going to change the dynam dynamics around that? Uh, yeah, Silver, do you want to address the how yeah. is China going to affect other countries? Yeah, thanks for your questions, Arnab. I, I, I want to be I want to be clear. I, I'm. Yeah, with with that bullet point, I, I, um, I, I'm not implying that everything is going to be OK uh, and that like I'm I'm universally, uh, you know, hope, hopeful in that regard, particularly um, when it comes to, uh, you know, ensuring that um, uh, that emerging and developing economies get that the, get the support that they need to expand energy access and, and, uh, and adopt clean energy. I think I, I want to be very clear. I don't think that the that U.S. policy should force uh, um, should try to force other countries to take sides in in this sort of geopolitical conflict. I'm very, I, yeah, I'm 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 very emphatic on that. Our, our uh, you know, insofar as as you know, build back better international efforts and and sort of uh, other U.S. efforts to sort of uh, bolster um, uh, financing and 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 support internationally. These should not be contingent on on not accepting you know Chinese finance, um, uh, which is 
which you know, as we all know, is is just um, um, an immense source of uh, of sort of uh, support for for building infrastructure uh, and and uh, energy generation and, and uh, irrigation and 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 much more. Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would say that the, there are there are risks. There are there are concerns that um, this is one area where um, U.S.-China tensions uh, could have negative impacts, and that um, and U.S. policymakers should be very um, should be very careful to to avoid that from to to prevent that from happening. Uh, given the time constraint, uh, Tobia, do you want to ask uh, answer the second question regarding? I mean. You know, we're talking about U.S. influence in China, how you know, China is influencing the U.S. in the decarbonizing. Uh -huh. um, yeah, this is a question. Um, I mean, I guess I, I would like to be hopeful to an extent about this, that this would, that, that gains from China in these sectors would um, be a way to, like, for, for those of us who want to advocate for, for stronger action within the U.S., that that can like help contribute to that. And um, I, uh, yeah, uh, in, like a big picture strategic perspective, um, I'm very wary of relying too much on U.S.-China competition narratives to argue for improvements in U.S. policy. I think there are, certainly from a progressive perspective, a lot of traps um, in, in using arguments like, oh, well, we have to do more in this climate thing, otherwise China's going to eat our lunch. I think that builds into... Uh, bigger narratives that, that that I think are overall deleterious to uh, progressive uh, priorities, but um, insofar as that like creates new openings, and I think that's um, that's that's welcome. And if if we could get into a, a mode where there's like where it's 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 not a zero sum competition around economic and military power, but a competition over who's going to be the best actor on climate, then uh, I think some good come can can come out of that. I will leave the last question to John to answer. I mean, in terms of compliance on the you know local level beyond the weather uh, agencies. Yeah, thank you for the question. I will answer both the second and third question together. So I think it's a bit too immature to say that China already reached uh, the dominance in, in new, the new economy, right? If you look at the solar supply chain, uh, China is very good at manufacturing and scaling up. But in terms of the most advanced technologies, most the U.S. still has many, many things to offer. U.S. Is a, that's why many Chinese international students still come to the U.S. to study because it's technically the most advanced country. Right? So I think it's too uh, immature to say it's already reaching a dominance. And I also think that the Chinese authoritarian model is not the best way, just coming back to my point, it's not the best way to deal with climate change. And Bureaucratic control and the system based on state-led bureaucratic control creates all kinds of problems. And the compliance problem is certainly one of it. And, but if you follow the Chinese news, the, the biggest news last week was power crisis, right? So many people suddenly lose power for hours in many provinces. And there are already 20 different provinces issue warning that they will do sporadic power outage from time to time, right? And this is a result of direct bureaucratic control on, on electricity price and also the market force that the coal is getting so expensive then, then the, its power plants are losing money to, to generate power, right? And a, a authoritarian system runs into all kinds of problems and, and therefore, Yes, compliance problem, and also, and another question: dominant is is not there yet. Yeah, I'll end here. Thank you. You know, thank you to all the panelists for the you know great discussions, and I again I want to say thanks Silver and Brick Institute for uh, Breakthrough Institute for this discussion beyond you know the scope of the U.S. And I hope you know everyone here find it uh, informative. Uh, so let's give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>